and welcome to another forum in our Above or Beyond Reasoning series. Today our topic is unconscious bias. And joining me to have this most timely and important discussion are Dr. Hope Shaw, Mrs. Sarah Jones, Mr. Ivan Gibbs, and Dr. Liakim Samaj. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome, let's get right to it. I'm gonna start by asking you to briefly, in, and br that's briefly, introduce yourselves, sharing your background, your heritage, and uh, tell us exactly what you do, so we can set the stage. Am I there? Starting with you, Dr. Hope. Okay, I'm Hope Shaw. I was born in Jamaica, I am, um, my background is, I suppose, in the interest of time, I'll just say I'm a nurse. I was trained at Kingston School of Nursing. I moved to the United States uh, about 26 years ago, and I continued my nursing training. I uh, eventually got into the education specialty. So I am a nurse educator. Uh, currently, I work as an adjunct faculty and an independent consultant. Um, so I have my own business, and I also work in a faculty position at one of our local universities. Okay, great. So I hop over to Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm from North Wales um, in, in the UK. Um, operations manager at Grace Food. I've been there for 22 years. Um, I've lived in North Wales most of my life, and I've got two lovely little kids, Isabel and Joseph. Great. All right. So hop over to Ivan. Yeah. Ivan Gibbs. I, I was born in um in Jamaica. Um went to Cornell College and I, I met Hope Shaw, Hope Gordon back then. Um I became in the college and we remained friends. I went to cast, um, studied finance there, and um I moved to the States maybe some thirty-two years ago. And I currently work as a management consultant in the behavioral health field. And I have my own business. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So the thing is that most people think that they are very rational and objective when they're making decisions. But is and we this know that really... made a decision to exclude me <laughs> in the introduction. But I understand that's how unconscious biases work, yes. <laughs> accustomed, I'm so accustomed to having you as a part of the team that I totally forgot to welcome you and to ask you to introduce yourself. That's how biases are. That's how biases are. You are correct. Yes. <laughs> Go right ahead, Dr. Samaj. <laughs> My name is Leah Kim Samaj, born in Jamaica. Um, tertiary education in the United States. New York. Now, Interestingly, you know, I taught at Cornell University for three years. And it's a very interesting phenomenon in that you're part of a, a minority within a minority. And it's a strange feeling to be the first black person on the faculty at the College of Human Ecology after all this time. So the whole experience of just being black in a totally white environment and all the expectations and all the pressures that... Now, I'm living in Jamaica. I'm a quantum transformation psychologist. And uh, we deal with change at all levels. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bias at work, Dr. Samad. <laughs> okay, so I said most persons think that they are rational and objective when they're making decisions. But is this so, you know? Bias is, is a weakness we all have developed as, as human beings because the brain uses previous information stored to make decision making less onerous. And can you imagine if we didn't have this tool, how difficult life would be? But, you know, having to, to think hard and really concentrate every time we're going to perform a task or we have to make a decision. So this shortcut, can be quite useful, right? But most of the things we do repeatedly 
are done without conscious thought. However, what we really want to focus on together is what happens when these shortcuts do not serve us or they do not serve others. What happens when the shortcuts actually hurt others based on the association that our brains make at a deep conscious level? And um, I'm, I'm going to start by just throwing out some of the most obvious biases because sometimes there are some that we don't think about at all. So there are the obvious ones like race, gender, you know, age, weight, yes, <laughs> skin tone, somebody's language, and even more so their accent. Even within the same language, depending on the accent, you know, one could be seen as less than or more than or just right. Disability, your appearance, you know, are you perceived to be beautiful, not so beautiful, um, nationality, religion, and the list goes on. And uh, what we really want to focus on is not what is obvious, but what I want to refer to as the implicit, the unconscious bias, the bias that we are not even aware of. And that's what I think is really the danger zone. I am going to have each person speak briefly on unconscious bias, just from your own perspective, however you want to approach it. And I'm going to go in the same order again, starting with Dr. Hope, what exactly is unconscious bias, you know, and your experience with it? I think the tendency, uh, Sandra, is for, you know, when we first heard, hear the term implicit bias, is to really, because of the current environment that we're in, we tend to associate it with race. Um, but I'm glad that you actually kind of break that down just so the, the listeners can get an understanding that we're not just focusing on race. But to me, what implicit bias means is, is pretty much is our attitudes and the stereotypes that we make about uh, people, we make about or interact, even before we actually start interacting with these individuals, we already are coming to the table with these, as we call it, implicit or, or, or unconscious bias. And I pause when I even talk about the terms unconscious um, versus the subconscious, because even that in itself, there is, I think the term is being misused. Uh, and, you know, try not to get too, uh, too researchy about this. I mean, we can easily, and Dr. Samaj, will probably is the, is the expert on, on this topic based on his background, but just skimming the, the literature, we have to think of basically the different planes of our mind, the conscious, the subconscious, and further down is our unconscious. So there, to me, there are what we call blind spots that occurs at a conscious, at a conscious level. It occurs at a subconscious level and it also occurs at an unconscious level, whether it is about race, religion, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's weight, uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah? Okay. So um, for me, when I think about unconscious bias, it's about how your brain um, reacts to situations. So it just looks at things, uses um, previous experiences and you just make that split second decision based on, on previous experiences and your cultural and your social stereotypes. Um, I think what I found from having read some stuff about unconscious bias recently is how little I realized I did it, <laughs> um, you know, and how my unconscious bias has changed um, in my adult life as I've grown up and how I've dealt with different people and how things have changed. So um, yeah, that's, Basically, what I'd say about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ivan, over to you. Yeah, I I think that um, when I think of um, implicit bias, is is that side of us that we blink on, we make split second decisions or judgments about people, things, and situations. But then it comes to from whence does this come? It is part of 
our makeup. It is part of uh, that second nature. Things that we've heard before, we've seen before, we're, we've witnessed. But then interestingly, I find that the bias part of it is not necessarily negative. For example, um, one could assume, uh, in my case, actually, it has happened a number of times. People assume that because I come from Jamaica, I'm a great singer <laughs> or I'm a great dancer. So whenever I'm in those kind of a social settings, I'm expected to perform, I'm expected to entertain, which is not necessarily bad, but yet still, it's a bias. I can't sing, maybe I can dance, but it, it, is, it is that expectation. I think more so when I relate this now to the, the work environment, the place where there's something bigger at stake, you know, people's lives and livelihood and, 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 and the governance in terms of laws, rules, and regulation. And then the downside to that is when we make those split second decisions that impact others negatively. And we didn't really go beyond the surface level and really use um, some facts, some evidence to actually um, suggest an alternate decision. Okay, great, thanks. Dr. Samad. I concur with what the others have said. So I just use my two seconds to ground it. Because I mean, that was what my PhD dissertation was about, 1978. I set out to understand the cognitive underpinning of how do we as human beings come to understand four constructs. I, we, us, them. And because it's, if you don't understand where it's coming from and what formulates it, then we're really just in the dark in terms of correcting it. And what was I was able to establish, you know, both empirically, looking at how gender and race and these things, these constructs come about early, that by age four to seven, between that black, pr prior to then, the child has no bias. Everything is seen as just equal input coming in. But then the socialization with the cognitive underpinning and the cogn cognitive capabilities that the child has developed. And what you get from, first of all, socialization, parental socialization, societal socialization, all of these things, the children start to understand my, me, my group, this is preferred. Others are not preferred. And left unchecked, that whole process just continues to mushroom unless some intervention takes place and say that even though you are fine, it doesn't mean others have to be negative. And all of them, we start learning these things piece by piece. And in the absence of cognitive interventions, we drift to where we have become today, where it is just a part of this. It's almost the assumption yeah. that all of these people, so I'm around with everybody. I am fine, but everybody else in all the other forms, something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, you know, to, to just lay the framework and the foundation from what I have heard everybody said, it, it seems to me that the, the unconscious really is, is this part of ourselves that we cannot directly observe, correct? So it, it, it's, it's something that we, we are unaware of, that the conscious mind cannot directly observe the unconscious. And I want to start there because when persons say, I am not prejudiced, I am not racist, I, you know, I am not misogynistic, uh, you know, I, I take everyone into consideration. The fact is that we don't know what we don't know. And I think we all have to start with that acceptance. We don't know what we 
don't know if the unconscious means that you cannot directly observe it with a conscious mind. So someone would have to bring it to your attention. And if we look at bias, what you're all saying is that there is this inclination or prejudice for, as Ivan clearly pointed out, or against one group of person or group, especially in a way that can be considered unfair. So whether the bias is for or against, it can be considered to be unfair. So if we're looking at unconscious bias and putting both of it together, it seems that we're talking about, you know, your background, your personal experiences, stereotypes, cultural context that can impact on how your decisions and actions impact others without you realizing. And I, I want to, to, to share it this way so that, you know, because these things tend to be uncomfortable, um, these things tend to come across as being unpleasant and accusatory. So if we look at it this way from the inside out, then we realize that, you know, anyone really could find themselves um, being in this situation because it's something that you're, you're not consciously doing. So, so when our brains are making these very quick judgments and assessments of people and situations without us realizing it, you know, clearly if there is some automatic stimulus in, in, in you know, then this will tend to happen. No, I, I want to throw out a scenario and I, I'm starting with a big one. I'm throwing out a scenario. So there's this radio program on BBC and um, I may have shared it with, with some of you guys before. And this caller, um, who is a white woman, she calls into the program and she says, it shames me. It shames me that I feel this way, but I don't know why. I don't know where it stems from. It's completely against everything I believe in. How do I fix this? Now the host of the program is saying, that's my reality every day. I see someone like you walking down the street and I immediately cross the road because I do not want you to feel uncomfortable. You see what's happening here? Mm -hmm. So it shames her that she feels this way. Mm. Why? And he crosses the road when he sees her at a distance because he doesn't want her to be uncomfortable. Now, how did we get to a place where somebody has to live with this every single day in every situation this black man has to live with this reality and anyone can take a first to go at it i was thinking so yeah. when we started talking about the scenario and my mind took me to a place thinking about the concept of implicit bias and i, I the more i read the more i'm bec i realize and come into terms that this is actually part of our survival instinct. It is normal, uh, but to your point is that it, it is, exists in a, in, a, in a forum where, whether it's at work, uh, whether it's you know, in our interactions with people where we are marginalizing individuals and to, uh, to Ivan's uh, point where we are keeping people out of basically that trajectory in moving up the corporate ladder, um, then something is wrong with it. But there's nothing, everyone, everybody, um, Sarah, Lakeham, Ivan, myself, you, we all have unconscious biases. And I think it's a way we exist as human beings because the, not, the tendency for people is to really, we, we, Sameness is what we have an affinity for likeness. If I, if you put a group of us, bring a group of us together, uh, you will find that, for instance, myself as a nurse, we all will get together in a huge group. But then I'm also an operating room nurse, so we'll gather together as operating room nurse, and then you take that group down to another smaller group as an educator, and we all have that affinity. 
to really kind of get together with that likeness, that sameness. I'm glad. I, that I, I agree with that, but I, I want to throw in something here and I want Dr. Samaj to pick up on this. No, I totally accept what you're saying and it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's survival. It makes us not have to think about every single thing. Um, but that's the problem with it as well. Why should this man has to live his life every single day worrying about how his very existence, the fact that he is who he is, is going to cause someone else to believe, behave, and feel a certain way. And he is the one who has to do something about it. Over to you, Dr. Simmer. I'm glad Hope started where she did, because look, we start up with these heuristic shortcuts. Because without them, we'd have to discover and interpret the world totally every morning we open our eyes. But along the way, again, back to those four constructs, I, we, us, them, we're given implicit and explicit definitions as we, as we grow. Now, the incredible thing is that our contact with the universe around us, a very small portion is direct, but the vast amount of it is indirect, mediated. What's that mediation? Books, magazines, newspaper articles, television shows. I remember once my children, when they were very young, asked, Daddy, black people don't make movies? Because every movie they've ever seen is always about white people and white people are the stars and then we're socialized with tarzan oh you mean this white man he went to africa and he can talk to the animals and the native run you know so all of these issues that help to shape our definition of i so first of all whichever the group that you see as part of i and the group that we learn as part of we yeah, yeah. initial understanding is that we are better than them. It is much later on, it's unless something kicks in, but, but they can also be good, whatever the they is, whatever the us is, so that the, almost the natural process got us to where we are today. And look, you go to an all-girls school, your worldview is very different. Oh, girls can lift up class boards too, and girls can do this too, and so on. You go to a co-ed school. Oh no, girls don't do this, boys don't do that. Mm -hmm. So just the experiential. Just imagine someone who had to learn the world from scratch every day. So the good thing about where we are now as a people is that the veil has been lifted and we now do not, no longer make assumptions that us is always us and them is always them. Mm -hmm. and I. How, who I, you're the group that you are part of. So for example, when Hope is part of the group called Nurse, that's a whole different thing. Ivan is part of the, the, the group called People Coming From Jamaica. So people use all kind of heuristic shortcuts to explain mm -hmm. until they get to narrow down, narrow down, narrow down. And the problem comes in is that there's very little context for us people to narrow down to find out. But who is really, who is really this person? Mm -hmm. That they use all the shortcuts. And most of these shortcuts give thanks at least in case of Ivan is about singing and dancing. Then they must say, Mr. Yardy, and then, well, maybe they say, don't say it to his face. I mean, that there was a scammer. And a, so whatever all those other groups are. So the fact that we are in a position now that this, this discussion can take place. I'm so going to draw um, Sarah in here and uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, just share something and then to get her, her input and then I will go to, to Ivan. So we spoke about unconscious bias and groupings and labels and how it's about us and them and always that we are better than them. Um, but I want to throw something here in to say not necessarily so. Um, sometime the they can always be better, depending on who the they are. 
And uh, I and since we're, we started with race, um, I, I want to throw in some terms here. Thugs, white privilege, ghettos. You know, that, what comes to mind as I say those things? White privilege is a term that some persons find upsetting and offensive. And as I say, some of the conversation today may be unpleasant to some of our listeners, but the fact of the matter is that we can't fix things unless we get to a place where we all become uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so it refers to the concept that some people have basic rights and benefits simply because of the color of their skin which mean others don't simply because of the color of their skin. Um, it doesn't mean that they haven't suffered any hardship or that they haven't had a tough life. It, it just means that sometimes the skin that you're born into makes your life harder or it makes your life easier. So if you put it another way, it's like, so if there's something called white privilege, which is a benefit, then there could be something which um, by the fact that you are black or brown would put you in a class where you now have this extra burden of worrying about how you will, will be treated, perceived because of bias. Jump in here, Sarah. Okay, so I think from personally my own experience, I come from a very rural area, which is predominantly white. I went to a university in a, a city which was predominantly white and it wasn't until I hit my 20s that I really started to interact with people from different countries. You know, it's, it was just the way it was. The telly was very, it was not very diverse. Um, there wasn't much, it was mostly white, what we saw there. So I think how my unconscious bias in my early 20s is different to what it is now. I work for a Jamaican company and our head office in the UK is in London. So from working for this company, I have had to, well, I have worked with lots of different people from lo lots of different places. And I think it's really helped me grow um, just by having to interact with people that I didn't have to interact with before. I think what I, I find difficult at the minute with what's going on is how little I understand. A perfect example, Black Lives Matter. I saw what happened in America and I was horrified. And this is going to sound terrible, but I, you know, I didn't think we had the same kind of issues in the UK because the police don't shoot people. They don't shoot black people. They don't shoot white people. We don't have guns. So when I started seeing on my Instagram and my Twitter people saying, this happens to me all the time, I'm always getting stopped, I'm always getting, um, you know, I just, I, I get, I feel uncomfortable in certain situations, things like that. I was really shocked and it made me think twice about my life. I understand when people, you know, there was the whole thing about Black Lives Matter and how all lives matter. It's not about that. It's about the fact that you're at a disadvantage because of the colour of your skin. Not always, but occasionally. And just that we, we as white people, you don't have that barrier. It's, there's no physical barrier. There may be other barriers, but there's no physical barrier. It's not something that you see straight away. So I think what's happening at the minute, although it's atrocious, it's really good to be able to develop our knowledge. And hopefully, through things like social media, education, definitely, um, we will see more diversity and then it won't, we won't be thinking, oh, I, you know, I live in a white village, so everything I unconscious, all my unconscious biases are towards white people. If you see more of everyone together, more diversity, it will slowly erode away, but it's a really huge issue, I think. Before I go to Ivan, let me ask you this, just being very curious, seeing that you're yeah. the only person I can ask this. <laughs> or, uh, um, you said it was in your 20s that you really started to interact with people who were different from you and to come to a conscious knowledge of that. Um, yeah. Prior to that, what was the knowledge you had of the others? Say Black I, You know, you know, um... And you can please be as blunt as possible. I mean, I, know, I didn't. I, there was, I, mean, it was, it was, I wouldn't say 
if it's anything negative, it's just I hadn't never met anyone. I'd never met anyone from Jamaica. I'd never met anyone from most probably no one further than I maybe France or Spain or I, you know, it's, I live in a village of 500 people in like quite a, it, we're very rural. So, you know, it's just, I didn't really, I've met Americans, but all the Americans I've met were um, white and had come over to university. So had lots of money. So I, I wasn't getting a broader impact of what nations are like, you know, it, it, it's just the way it was. And I think that in the UK since um, we've had more Europeans in and, and, you know, there's lots of Jamaicans here and, I, you know, it's a multicultural um, country. And I think that it's just developed and okay. yeah, I was very naive. It's taken a long time, but I was very naive. Okay, great. Um, just to share some figures from your own space, the UK, <laughs> um, you, you know, just to respond to something that you said about maybe occasionally, occasionally black people are treated differently. Um, 2018 to 2019, black people are more than nine times as likely to be stopped and searched by the police yeah. as white people. They are over three times as likely to be arrested as white people for the very same thing. And um, they are more than five times as likely to have force used against them by the police as white people. 90% um, of the time, they are not addressed in, an, in a formal way when stopped by the police. So there is no respect, um, you know, as you know, uh, to a white person, the quotation says the officer would say, um, sorry to bother you, ma'am. Sorry that I had to stop you. However, you know, um, Miss so and so, Mr. So, sir, ma'am. Um, if the person is brown or black, there are none of those courtesies. And this is listening to actual tapes that have yeah. been recorded. Um, a quarter of the prison population comes from 14% um, of the population. You know, so this is just stats that I'm just sharing. No, Ivan, I'm jumping over to you. Um, I understand that your situation is quite unique um, because your family is multiracial. Um, I, I want you to weigh in here on, you know, this whole bias as it relates to race because you would have really experienced this and understand it probably better than I would. Yeah, I mean, I think that consciously, I did not experience and realize racism until probably about 1993. So my mother is Jamaican and she's biracial. And so her mother is Afro-Cuban and her father is Jamaican white. So growing up, I had multiracial cousins. And so, and I had a pretty diverse set of friends. Never thought anything of it at all. And so I had actually seen on TV and I heard stuff and I was trying to understand it even in my 20s and I really didn't quite understand it. But I remember specifically um, the very first time in 1993 when I experienced racism in Detroit. So this is my story. My, my, my wife, who is a white American uh, woman, she's very... She's an extrovert and I'm the introvert. So we had a lunch date down in, in Detroit and we bounced up to the restaurant all, you know, fun. And just at that time, I told her what drink I wanted, but I had to go to the bathroom. And so I'm coming back and I saw her chatting up a storm with this waitress. And I got there, ordered my drink, Half an hour later, my drink didn't come. But I remember like at that time, consciously thinking, you know, sometimes 
there are teaching moments. And I thought to myself, okay, today I'm going to be this arrogant black man and I'm going to teach her something. But then I decided not to. It wasn't worth my time. So I kind of dismiss it. Um, about a month later, I went to West Virginia. I was like, wow. So I have actually experienced some stuff and I had to really like be having these conversations with myself about what do I do? When do I teach? When do I ignore? And that stuff. But I, I know that, you know, maybe because of my Jamaican upbringing, I decided to myself, I was never ever gonna allow anybody to um, let me feel anything other. Because I remember making a very conscious decision around about summer 1988, that I was never again gonna seek the affirmation of anybody. I respect people, but I was never going to. So you move forward now to where people would say to me, oh gosh, Ivan, you're the whitest black man I've ever met. I'm like, what? What does that mean? Because, so, so that's one example. Or somebody would say to me, we love you so much because you're not like those Detroit Blacks. What does that mean? I'm laughing, Ivan. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because what, what that sounds to me like are these biases. As a Jamaican, you're supposed to look a particular way, sound a particular way. You're not supposed to dress. You're not even supposed to be that educated. You're not supposed to live over there and that kind of stuff. So I think over time is when that unconscious bias is now informing conscious decisions, that's where the, the real problem that I see. But I, I mean, I, I've seen a lot and I've actually, you know, um, thankfully in my profession, I've had the opportunity to um, enlighten a lot of people in terms of my job and how they can actually do some things differently. So your wife is white, so you have, you have biracial I have two, children. I have two biracial children. That's interesting. I mean, how is that different for you when you go out with your family? I mean, I guess you'd have gotten accustomed to it now, but I'm just curious. C can you share with us? I mean, how does that even feel? How does that feel? It is, it, um, I am, because I don't seek other people's affirmation, I tell you, I'm very comfortable. Yeah. I am very, very, very comfortable. And my children, I remember we made a decision. We actually left the United States in 1994 and purposefully went to Jamaica to have our children. Mm. And so my children, you know, they tell everybody that they're Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. And we can have some very beautiful conversations that I can say I'm really proud of them. They really dig into, into issues, they understand and that kind of stuff. But, um, and, and, and so my, my children, you know, even though they're 26, 25 now, when we're out in public, um, we're very loving. And that is sometimes unexpected. You know, this black family is not supposed to be that loving. You know, so there, there are different sides to it, but we deal with it. And we've, we've been able to have some icebreakers where we have some conversations with some people about some stuff. But um, it, it's very interesting. And at times it, it's, it's very painful. Yeah. I've had to have some serious conversations with them. I have a cousin here in Michigan who is, he's, um, he's black like I am. And he's actually a, a, a state trooper that teaches other police officers. And so I remember uh, back a few months ago when he called me early morning, 
and he was actually very tearful and we we're just rapping and it came up like he does not know what to go home and tell his children his son about the situation so going back and forth for me there are different opportunities to to enlighten myself and, and to mm -hmm. learn and then every now and then the opportunity presents itself that I have to teach other people yeah. um, because of their own ignorance or because they're forced to learn something. But Ivan, I'll ask a question and anyone can take it. I mean, for, for quite a while, the oppressed feel that the burden to teach others should not really be on them. Um, how do you respond to that? Why should the burden that the oppressed have to carry every single day, why should the additional burden be on them to teach others about their ignorance? You know, because it, it means then that there are some persons who have the luxury, and I call it the luxury because it's not a right that we all enjoy, have the luxury of being able to step outside without fearing that they're going to be discriminated against or oppressed in any way because of how they look. I mean, I don't know if some white persons ever think about that, that you have the luxury of stepping outside without any fear that you are going to be discriminated against because of the color of the skin you live in which you would not have chosen if you knew that this is how the world was set up. You know, anyone can weigh in here because I mean, it's a I, burden. Uh, if I may, the Jamaican saying, who have raw meat, seek fire. So we have been the victim of it. So I don't mind being the one to try to res resolve it and to teach. And every now and then we get an option to sort of jump the queue. So for example, when I taught at Cornell, I insisted that I wanted to do a, not just a child development class, I wanted to do a separate class called the development of the black child, where we would treat black children as a primary population, not as just an adjunct to white. The class had a listing of 25 students, but the average attendance was 60. It was a, a school that was 97% white. The world started getting around that here's a chance for them to hear some things that they didn't, they never heard before. So that you'd have all of these students who knew that they couldn't get no credit for it, but they were hearing things that they never heard before. And on top of that, when you'd pass by the dorms at night, I'd, I'd hear my voice because there were those who taped the class and then played it back in the dorm as entertainment because they were hearing things. So when you talk about white privilege, it also locked them out from a certain understanding. First of all, one, that a black man could be brilliant, could be intellectually brilliant to be, uh, to, to be their lecturer. And that there was information about black children that was so different from what they've ever heard. When you were talking about the UK, one of the other stats is that the, 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 the black child, especially the child from Caribbean immigrant parents, is almost 90% likely to be in the ESL classes. Education was subnormal. Cause just the assumption is that because of your accent, you don't understand English. <laughs> you know, so I'm saying that every now and then, yes, we get an opportunity to teach. By so virtue. you think that we have a responsibility, Lakem, um, to shoulder this and not see it as a burden because we are the ones who are more impacted? I say, yes, we do in more ways than one because there was a whole another era where those of us, Black people who got squeezing through the door, we would try to be using the term what Ivan you're the whitest black man I know and we try our best and it's like it's supposed to be a compliment I mean it's yes. insulting 
and we try our best to fit in so that you, you know I'm not I'm not like one of those you know massa I'm not like going all the way back to the plantation now but then no it does nothing to impact the lives of the other lives that we have and it does nothing to help them but then when black persons people of other kind of ethnic diversity have a chance to break through yes it is part of your responsibility, not just to go in the door, but to kick down the door to make space for everybody. Because guess what? You're freeing everybody else. You're freeing the persons who had this limited experience. Oh no, there's more to the world than this. There's more to the world. So yes, it's our responsibility to do it. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. throw in another one here that Hope and, and Sarah, I want you to lead. And I, I'll throw out a scenario. And this I do deliberately because persons, irrespective of their race, still fall in a certain gender, and therefore they can relate to this one. And this, this, so you know where I'm going now. The next one I'm going with is unconscious bias as it relates to gender. And I throw out words now like male privilege beautiful woman, you know, hardworking male, you know, aggressive, assertive male, you know, um, you, you have uh, terms like angry woman, you know, um, a woman who oh, is so yeah. emotional. Um, well, it can't be just an angry woman because, you know, she just, she just happens to be a woman. Worse if you're a black, that's like another story altogether, <laughs> another subgroup called black women. But just being a woman, you know, um, not having a voice at the table, probably having to shout in order to be heard and all those things. So the scenario here is for a traditionally male job of police chief, and I say traditionally male job, evaluators run an experiment at Yale, and they have done this several times, and the results are always the same. No matter how you try, you found that... Um, a male is always considered for the role, irrespective of the applicants that came in from female, the applications that came in from female, even if they were just as qualified, more qualified, had the same experience or were more experienced. And like, you know, so what's, what's happening here? What's happening here? So when considering an educated media savvy family man, participants inflated the importance of those qualities <laughs> to get the job. But when considering a male applicant who lacked these qualities, they devalued them. So they weren't important anymore. No such favoritism was expended to female applicants. Male participants tended to exhibit this bias more than their female participants. Men also give more positive hiring evaluation to the male applicants than to otherwise identical female applicants. However, when they remove the names from the application, so just remove the name, so there's nothing to suggest if the applicant is male or female. Guess what happened? Strange thing happened. Men were now picking female applicants for chief of police. Ah. What's happening here? So again, because of unconscious bias, hope you jump in here. What's going on? I just an argument that I made earlier on Sandra that as human beings is that we have an affinity to for likeness. We have an affinity to move to to. It's our way of survival. Uh, for me, as a educator as a nurse when i select candidates say for a program where i'm training nurses for the operating room i actually intentionally go looking for male nurses why because it is a female dominated profession i remember one class that i had and i had recruited a group of students and two weeks into the program i had a few of my colleagues who stopped me privately and asked me, where are the black people? And uh, I actually had to do, a, I actually had to stop and kind of do some self-reflection and ask, starting to question my unconsciousness 
and wondering, did I deliberately pick white candidates or was I looking for the best candidates? Um, I, the answer that I came back, came with was I just picked the best candidates. And if you go across the number of cohorts that I've trained, you eventually you start seeing the diversity. But the point I, you know, to your point, uh, at, at least the point that I was trying to make is that it is normal to really have an affinity to, for, for the things that we are, yeah. that are like that are alike, that we feel comfortable with. It's part of survival. How do we get past this when we're hurting others and not choosing the best candidate? Because if you now choose a different candidate because you do not know that is Ma Michael as against Michelle, yeah. and you pick someone else, then that is telling me that your first choice was informed by something else. And, I'll and, tell and, you and when you remove the names, everybody seems to can do it right. But we also have to be careful without sometimes, sometimes our unconscious biases actually save us. Sometimes it does. And I have consciously gone out looking for diver to diversify and realize that because, because I was presented with a group of candidates that was only of this, you know, this was the pool of candidates. I selected somebody who was probably not really suited. They did not have all the attributes for, for this, for the job. But isn't that so, a different problem though, Hope, where we want the best people? We are talking about when our biases hurt others and close the door on others because of who they are, whether their skin color, their, their weight, you know, their gender. Right. And, and I'm, I'm going to ask Sarah to jump in here as a, as a female manager. Um, you know, what has been your personal experience, even with your, your female subordinates, the managers who you manage, and your own experience as a female, you know, making it in the executive sweet um are you do you experience this difference yes yeah I, I have experienced it in the past usually um it is in in meetings where we're bringing in people to discuss machinery and stuff like that and i will be introduced in the meeting and they tend to think that i'm there to either take notes or make the tea to begin with and it's only when i start speaking that they be, you can see a change in people's body language. Um, it's frustrating, um, but you get over, you do get over it. And I think it's something pers definitely for my own, me personally, I have my own unconscious bias towards myself as a woman. Um, I most probably have listened to everyone that has said, you know, it's my most important job is being a mother and that, you know, I'm not as aggressive as men and you, you, I think women, well, me personally, I don't go, I haven't got the drive of a man or I'm not quite as aggressive in the way that I deal with situations. So perhaps, how would you explain it? It's, it, it's, I, it's kind of like a self claimed prophecy where I'm, I don't, um, how would I, I almost talk myself out of things um, because I see that what I am really is a mother first. And then, although I've got this excellent position, I am nervous of it, you know, and I think that's just because of society. Generally, it's only now, in, in my opinion, more recently that women are becoming much more noticeable in business. You know, okay. um, so yeah, but I definitely have had quite a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I've also had situations where people have been rude. You know, I, I remember when I came back from maternity leave, someone saying to me that I couldn't use having had a baby as an excuse for something. And I was like, I'm not oh. using it as, as an excuse. But yeah, and I think people sometimes like to try and hurt you to prove their point. Interesting you know, that you said what? that, you know, there's something I always say when I hear these foolish things I are saying, you know, that having a uterus is not a bug in the design. It's actually just a yeah. feature of the design. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a bug. 
Um, Ivan, I'm going to jump over to you. Um, a lot of times men don't see male privilege. Just the same way how white people don't see white privilege. Um, what's your experience with that? Um, I, I think that um, within the environment that I, I now live in, um, quite honestly, I think I work with probably 95% of women. I mean, I work in a very female dominated field. And um, interestingly enough, again, because of what I do, and let me just say, one of the strongest women that I know and love and admire is my mother. Absolutely. Um, just a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with my sister and there are like 10 of us. And I was asking, how did she do it? We grew up poor, but she did everything. Bargain, barter, second job, just to make sure that we had. And even though looking back, I knew we were poor, I didn't quite realize how poor we were when I was growing up. But my mother, you know, has always been that central figure to, um, to balance out everything. And so now I have, you know, I've had so many female bosses and, you know, at work. Um, I have um, 14 people in my office and I'm the only male. So probably Ivan, your background, your socialization and so on would have prepared you in a very different way for how well, you, mean, you approach life. I, I, I think it is, which, yeah. which basically I do believe, I do believe that, um, that character and, and that early nurturing that Dr. Smudge spoke of, it informs my policies and it informs my practices. So you're accustomed to being around a strong female based on your mother. So, you know, for you, that's not a problem. Dr. Samaj, talk to me about male privilege. I mean, do you find that you're the benefactor of male privilege? I mean, do you see females being seen as less than? What's your experience? Well, in many instances, uh, there's a, a deference to you because, I mean, many people were so socialized that the man is the leader. The man is the head. Um, I try my best not to take on that burden from the standpoint that let, make somebody else do the heavy lifting too. It's not just because me as a man. But I think that what I've come to realize, one of the most important antidote to whether it's been male privilege or white privilege or gender bias or whatever, is um, diversity in perspective, meaning that we're able to draw data points from as many different and diverse, not group think, because you can have a group of people all of different race and class, but they all think the same because they went to the same school. But you genuinely need people at the table who get there from different roots, different perspective, but Knowing that while they're there, they don't have to forget where they're coming from. They don't have to wipe it out. And you're expected to represent the totality of who you are. What happens now is a richness of the decisions being made. So whether it's hiring, whether it's promotion, whether it's, it, it could even be as far as a company doing a marketing campaign. If everyone in the room making a decision are part of one narrow perspective, you can end up having some very bad decisions being made. Yep. So more and more we're coming to realize now that even your own privileged position, whatever it was, is a way of locking you into just one small space of the universe. You too need the insights gained from the other perspective. Uh, early in the, my business life, we come up with some incredible campaigns and so on and some products and some services. And one of the things that I would always do, I would run it by the office attendant because she didn't have the bias and the corruption of higher education. And you, you, you tell oh, Dr. Samaj that now go work. <laughs> you know, just straight up say, but why? 
And all of a sudden, the assumptions that we made by virtue of our educated blinkers, she was able to show us that, no, the, the rest of us know that don't make no sense. So that we all benefit, no matter how smart you are. In fact, nobody's smarter than a team. Nobody is smarter than a team. And the more diverse that team is, because that team has a kid, just imagine a football team, and all you have on the team are just are, 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 are left foot strikers. You don't have people who naturally play defense, who naturally play wing, who are naturally going forward. So that to me now is where, how we get within any in, individual one of us, we're not going to solve the whole world by us. Yeah. We're part of a, a broader team and we understand and accept that then we will benefit and the decisions we make and all who are impacted by us will also benefit. Now, as, as we, we pull everything together, looking at the fact that these biases do exist, people are being negatively impacted, people are hurting, what do we do collectively and individually? One thing we cannot do is nothing. And when I hear people say, I'm not biased, I'm not racist, I'm not misogynistic, the, the, you, you, you know, maybe at that level, probably that is so, but you know, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis to help to fix that, to call it out? Question, Are yeah. we willing to have uncomfortable conversations? Are we willing... Go ahead, Dr. Simon. Very early in my professional career, in 1980, I wrote a paper and the title of it was Toward a Cultural Science. Why well, I wanted to create a framework within which I would work as a, because the words social scientists and natural scientists were taken constructs. And what they teach you is that as a, as, a, as a scientist, a social scientist, you're supposed to be objective. In the presence of oppression, objectivity is siding with the oppressor. In the presence of oppression, to be objective and neutral is by default siding with the oppressor. So one has to consciously, whether from a gender, a social class, a race perspective, once you decide to be neutral, nothing changes. So it means that some of us now have to consciously become activistic in the things we do so that we point out the obvious biases that are in systems, yeah. even to our own detriment, because after a while they get, oh, you come with that again? Yes, yes. I, that's exactly that. where I was going, yes. because as I asked each, each person to sum up for me the way forward and the solutions and recommendations, that's exactly what I wanted to put on the table, what Lakem just said, that when you call it out, when you push back, you are seen as the troublemaker, you know, the person who keeps playing the race card, the person who keeps playing the gender card or the weight card or whatever it is. You know, it's not seen for what it is. And so those who seem to be rewarded are those who keep quiet, you know, make sure that they fit in, you know, don't have any locks like hope over there and make sure that everything is nice and smooth and, and women who try to be as, uh, you know, ascribe to all the female labels as possible, you know, to be nice, <laughs> that one in particular, <laughs> to be nice and not assertive and, you know, carry the emotional burden of the whole organization when the female co male counterparts are not expected to do that at all. You know, they're just being strong managers when they do otherwise, but if it, as a female manager, you know, if you don't know, then you are a word that starts with the letter B. So, you know, as we look at oh, all of these things, <laughs> you know, I'm going to start with you, Hope, and then Sarah, then Ivan, then they can, you, you wrap up. What do we do? It is now 2020. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Where do we go from here? Well, we've already had the conversation, Sandra, and the fact that we're actually having this forum, it's an indication that uh, the conversation, and this is not the only forum where the conversation is taking place. 
Uh, it's interesting that when you mentioned my locks, I remember just briefly, if I can uh, just recall, when I started locking my hair a few years ago or talked about locking my hair, I had a colleague who said to me that you're not going to get promoted. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, because your locks, basically you're already a female, uh, you are educated and now you have the locks. And I, and I started to question myself and even... To me, that was also as a, that was more of a motivation to lock it than not to lock it. But where did that come from? That came from, to Ivan's point, I came from my heritage. It came from my background. It came from being brought up in a family and feeling like I was, I belong. Uh, my mother taught me that education could take me as far as I want to go. So even when I moved here to this country and I had to face the reality and start you now being, for the first time, being aware of my skin. Cause, and that's what is so wrong about a lot of things, unfortunately. I love a lot of things about the United States, but there's still some wrongs that needs to be corrected. And it's not just the United States. Malcolm Gladwell, um, in, I don't know how many people have read the book Blink, he talked about the power of thinking without thinking. It happens to us all the time. As long as there's not marginalization, as long as there's not disenfranchisement, uh, people are not being disenfranchised, um, as long as we try to, I call it, move the goalposts and get a more equitable playing field, I think we're moving in the right direction. Do I think that we're gonna have an equitable world? Um, unfortunately, Sandra and the rest of the panelists, I don't think so. But I think we can start real, get, you know, and we already see it, we already see it where a lot of companies, organizations, individuals are actually turning the mirror on themselves and saying, wow, I, don't, I didn't realize that we didn't have any women in the C-suite. I didn't realize that we didn't have more diversity in the C-suite. I do it when I go looking for more diversity in my groups, um, making sure that they are male nurses because they are already unrepresented, um, underrepresented in the profession. Mm -hmm. So I have to make an effort. So if, me, if I as an educator do that, I also believe that in different forums, there has to be and there should be a conscious effort to make sure that we move the goalposts mm -hmm. and try to make it. It's not going to be equitable, but I think it will make it to better. a better point. It will make the decision making more robust. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, there will be better representation. And I think the, the, the outcomes can be nothing but better. Great. Sarah. Okay, so personally, I think it's about slowing down when you make decisions and reviewing the decisions you make and taking note and accepting them, accepting that sometimes you are unconsciously biased towards people. And if you see that what that does, it hurts someone, is that you learn to change it, that you can review when you're doing things that might possibly hurt someone. From a business point of view, I think it's about training having things like unconscious bias training so people actually understand about it because i think a lot of people don't even realize it's happening um as well as that i would say having conversations they're not you know ask me asking my peers if they think that i deal with certain things in the incorrect way or if i'm being unconsciously biased towards someone opening up that forum so that people can talk and then I think the biggest one is about education from preschool all the way up, having diversity. So ensuring that what we all see is a, diver a diverse world where we know about, you know, my perfect example is that I had no understanding of <laughs> anything other than what I see in front of me. So it's having a diverse knowledge and in education we're taught about other things that we don't know about you know just being diverse i think more than anything yeah and then social media for me personally having watched lots of social media recently is i'm learning stuff i'm training myself i'm seeing things and i'm starting to investigate stuff that 
didn't really enter my consciousness at all beforehand. So social media is really good. I think it can show you the bad things as, you know, well, sometimes there's bad things on there, but most of the time it opens your eyes to being able to see all of these other things that are going on in the world. Okay, Ivan. <clears throat> yeah, I, I totally like the idea um, to pick up from what um, um, Dr. Smart was saying about the team being the smart. I like the idea of this big tent. How do we grow it? But I think one part of the, the block, which is created in some part by um, implicit bias, is that it blocks opportunity for a lot of people to actually come into and be a part of that team. And so the smartest people, then what? But unfortunately, it's such a hard lift. I know how fixable this is, but it seems to be a constant. We constantly have to work at it. Um, I, I tell you a quick um, personal thing that happened. Because um, a lot of the, the companies, client companies that I work with, they are given federal contracts. And in these federal contracts, they need to have diversity. They need to show, they need to demonstrate in terms of their statistics. And some years ago, we were actually working on some, something and they realized they didn't meet it. So they could not get these, um, these uh, proposals done. So we set out to actually solve that problem by saying we need to employ more people. When I actually looked at how the process that they use to employ people, in terms of um, the advertisement, in terms of the timing of the placement of those, it excludes a large percent of our population. Basically, what happened is that people in HR knew that there was an opening, and when they go to their, their children's uh, birthday party and social events, that's when they talk about it. So the question begs, who are present at that within the earshot? It excludes a large percentage of the people, the very same people that they wanted to attract. So I set out later to actually open that up and that happened. So I took the next step and I actually designed a, a HR software to actually track those things. Yes, people came in the tent, but when you actually look at the coaching and the, the training that goes with it for advancement, you realize that there was another block in terms of missed opportunities for people to actually progress. So what I'm saying is that once you're given that opportunity, it's a long road to move it towards where we want it to be so that it seems to be a level playing field. But it, I, I agree with what Sarah said in terms of that slowing down and that decision making and monitoring and checking just to make sure that we're all being fair. But it's a long road. Long road. Lekan, what say you? You know, I'm with Ivan, you know, look. The second law of thermodynamics is very straightforward. Things go from order to disorder, unless energy is exerted. <laughs> Carter G. Woods remind us that, listen, power concedes nothing without a demand. We're talking about power. Who got the power? So there's no rush, there's no, and sometimes even by doing things, I can give you a simple example that, to tap into what Ivan just said. I worked on a project at Rutgers Medical School to look at the, the incoming process and the access available to black students. And we were happy that they were doing something well and that they were in, when I did, when I analyzed the data, something very straightforward, all the black students got grants. All the white students got research assistantships and teaching assistantships. But on the surface, but everybody's getting money. But at the end of the day, when I analyze and show them that, listen, the black student will come in and will never interact with a professor outside of class. So the whole professional, back to the, the, the parties, the professional socialization never took place. You got access to education, but the white student who was a research assistant, you're working toe to toe with the faculty. The teaching assistant, listen, I had the virtue of being a teaching assistant in graduate school. 
and by week two, I was going to parties at the professor's house. I was being part of that larger network yes, yes. that the rest of people who just got grants had no idea that other world existed. So yes, we can say we give them access, but if we don't allow them to understand the professional intricacies and access to areas that you can't just knock and walk through that door. So that where we have to power concedes nothing without a demand. So we have to keep demanding it, we have to keep pushing it. And at the end of the day, we collectively are better as a result of it. Mm -hmm. That is, we have gone as far as we can go based on the limitations that we have. Now it's time for us to now start to break down some of these and to create a better system. That the arc moves towards justice. It's a long arc sometimes. And as Ivan said, we're tired sometimes. But guess what? We can't get weary. Okay. Um, Those you know, are dependent on us. We who have gotten this far have a responsibility to take the ball a couple more yards down the road. To just pick up on that and pull it all together, I, you know, I think what I hear everybody saying is that you know, when you walk through the door, whichever door it is, you need to hold it open. You need to hold it open for others to walk through. It's yeah, not God. enough. It's not enough for you to just walk through that door. We have to help others to get access. Another thing it seems like we have to do is that we have to make sure that we understand other people's story. We don't fear people whose stories we know. That is why Ivan didn't fear other people's story because he had a multiracial family, his mother, his grandparents. He grew up with people who look different and sound different, probably spoke Spanish. Eh? And, and so when we understand where others are coming from, we don't fear them. That's why the lady, you know, gets afraid and the man crosses the road because she doesn't want to upset her because they don't understand each other's stories. We have to understand our history, which means that we have to start listening to each other. We can't come together if we don't listen to each other. Meaning you talk, I listen. I talk, you listen. And then the other thing is that we have to have meaningful conversations, not just talk. Meaningful conversations can become unpleasant, uncomfortable, but we have to have these bold, courageous conversations. We can't just allow things to slide. Sometimes we are tired. You know, the struggle continues. We want the struggle to be over. But the fact of the matter is that we can't, we can't give up. So, you know, white people, you have a role to play. Men, <laughs> you have a role to play. Educated women, <laughs> you have a role to play. I mean, whichever group we find ourselves in, we have a responsibility to call out our peers when we see them in the wrong. We have to do it. Men, when you see other men giving women a hard time in the boardroom and in the organization, call them out. When they steal the woman's idea, call them out. When they no, talk shame. over her, call no, them out. Not shame, it should be shame. It should be, it should be shame. It should be shame. It shouldn't be, no, it should not be. It should not be shaming. Oh, I see what you're saying, that you are saying that it should not be seen as shaming when you call it out. Yes, because the, the, the platform in which you call it out, you, I think it also to be sensitive, um, this is not a behavior that should be shamed. Like, you know, you don't call it out in public, but it should be called out. Well, I don't know if I agree you know, <laughs> that it shouldn't be called out in public because it's happening in public. Um, so mm -hmm. I... I, I can't understand that if a woman is making a point and her male counterpart is talking over her, that it should not be called out right there and then. Why should I wait until after the meeting? But that's just my personal perspective because it's been yeah. done publicly. You know? Well, listen, there's, there's a two level to this. For example, 
there's something called when you, you literally just went a social intervention. Listen, Mr. Brown, could you give Jennifer a chance to finish? Exactly. It happens like, Mr. Brown, listen, could you, could, you, could you give Hope a chance to finish? Exactly. And then after the meeting, you meet with him one-on-one -on -one and say, listen, that I, I hope it didn't upset you when you did that, but it is something you do every time. You don't give the woman a chance to finish their point of view. Maybe it's not conscious on your part, but you know, I'm just trying to gently remind you that you really need to give them because they have an equal reason to be at this table. And if you keep interrupting, we won't get the benefit of their wisdom. So is that is that okay, Hope? Is that what you yeah, that's the yes, it actually and I know we're probably pushed for time, but it kind of struck a little a sensitive nerve for me because I was involved in a conversation with a male colleague and uh, it was reported that I was being aggressive. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't call it out, but in the sense of as far as addressing it in a public space, but I basically sent an email, requested a meeting and pretty much questioned my boss why, as to why as a male and a female, we're having a passionate conversation and I am being labeled as an aggressive. I said, I'm female, I'm black. Um, it's like I was trying to understand and she actually paused for a second, thought about it, and she offered an apology. So to your point, uh, Lakem, that was what I was alluding to, is I could have basically, you know, publicly addressed it because we've had many meetings where we all sit together, but I thought the professional thing to do was to sit one-on-one uh, -on -one in a private meeting and make her aware that I was not satisfied with basically being labeled as an aggressive black female and my white counterpart was just seen as being assertive. Point taken, and I think you're both correct. Um, there are situations when you have to call it out at that point and say, give the other person a chance, you know, or say what will not be tolerated. But definitely, I mean, we have to deal with it in, you know, in a holistic way, which is whether it's going to HR, writing about it, having a conversation, yeah. because we cannot change what we tolerate. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes to. We cannot change what we tolerate. And hope I, 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 I hear that passion because I have experienced that several times. And, uh, you know, our men, you know, when privilege comes with responsibility as well. So when, when, when our men see women being treated that way, they should say something about it. Well, even in your personal life, when you go out with your spouse and you're, you are at knowledge and your spouse is not, you should call it out. You know, you go to a restaurant, the male is at knowledge and the female is as if she doesn't exist, even if she's the one paying the bill. You know, so I think we all have a responsibility to call it out and make people feel uncomfortable because nothing will change if everybody continues to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have to get out of our bubbles and our silos because if we only stay around people who are like us, nothing is going to change. Uh, we have to understand the differences and also accepting that different does not mean better or worse. <laughs> it is just what it is, you know. Um, I, I think this was a, a very good conversation. I think everybody came to it from a different perspective. I mean, I, 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 I was so much in awe when I heard some of the stories from Sarah and Ivan. And like, I have just no experience at all where that is concerned, Dr. Samadhi's experience at Cornell and, you know, hope your experience in the U.S. And, I mean, I guess the closest I came is in a graduate class. I mean, as the professor in a graduate class, a student put up her hand one day and asked, you know, if she could ask a question. And I said, sure. I thought it had to do with the business at hand. And she asked me, you know, how did you get the courage as a corporate, a female in corporate Jamaica to grow your hair like that naturally? Can you imagine that? <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine anybody asking Sarah where she got the courage to grow her hair naturally. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was an eye-opener, like, 
this is how my hair grows naturally. I happened to just allow it to grow and groom it. And she said, but how could you get the strength to do that? You're not going to be accepted. You know, that's not corporate enough. Yes. No, this is an MBA class. And I am teaching CEOs and VPs. And she was saying this with all the conviction she had in her heart because she felt like I stepped out of line and how did I do this? How could I, you know? And, and, and she said, is it, is it because you have achieved so now you can break the rules? That's something to think about. That's something to think about. I thank you all, it was wonderful. I think we may have to go for a round two. <laughs> Enjoy the weekend. Hey, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Ivan Sarah Lakem. Hope it was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good Let's go and try and change the world. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Bye. <laughs>